are really honored uh, that Ed Masri is going to come up and, uh, and talk to us. That's the goal, zero emissions. That's the challenge, cities and urban development. So what are the actions that must be taken that we all need to take to achieve that goal? Well, first, we're running out of time, so we need to act really fast. If we look at CO2 emissions worldwide, we see that it's a worldwide phenomenon now. Every country is now involved, so we need to act globally. If we look at CO2 parts per million in the atmosphere, we see that it's growing exponentially. It's not leveled out, and it's not going down. The good news is that we know where the emissions are coming from. 75% of all emissions are coming from the built environment. And we know in the built environment where most of those emissions are coming from. In cities, they're coming from the buildings that are in cities. So this is where we need to act. If we look at global building energy use from 1990 to present, we see that it's still going up. It hasn't peaked and it's not going down. And as a result, emissions in the building sector has increased 45% since 1990 and the projections are business as usual. If we keep doing what we're doing, it's gonna go up dramatically. And the reason that's a problem is because 74% of all the energy that goes to the building sector is fossil fuels globally. So in 2015, the world came together. They set a target, which was not in going over 1.5 degrees Celsius climate for um, global temperature change. And in order to meet that target, CO2 emissions has to peak now, between now and 2020, and then to decline to zero emissions by 2050. So that 2020 date is critical. So a little bit of background about where we're headed. By 2060, world urban population is expected to increase by about 2.67 billion people. What's phenomenal about that is by 2060, world urban population is expected to increase by 2.75 billion people or more than the total population growth. So people are moving into cities and it, it's absorbing the total global population growth. So that's where all the building is going to happen. Or we can say every week about 1.5 million people are being added to cities worldwide. Today, global building floor area is 223 billion square meters. This is what we need to get our head around. By 2060, global building floor area will increase by 230 billion square meters, or double the total building square footage we have in the world today. So in four decades, we're gonna build out another planet and add it to the planet we already have. In four decades, in 40 years. What's also interesting is about 40% of that is gonna happen in the next 15 years. By 2032, 33, 40% of the entire built environment in the world today is gonna to be built in a very, very short period of time. To get a handle on what that 40% is, it's all the buildings in Canada, the US, Mexico, Brazil, Argentina, Chile, Central America, Europe, all 28 countries, all the buildings in those countries, that's 40%. That's what's gonna be built in a decade and a half globally. So the date we've all been talking about to get the zero net carbon in all this new construction has been 2030. That's now out the window. 
we need to act now. If we wait to 2030 to do that, 40% of the world will be built out again between now and then. So we need to act right now and start to make big changes between now and 2020. So the new date we need to start thinking about is the next year and a half, two years. And every effort that we make has to have an impact, no more one-offs. So if we do something, it has to impact. It has to be scalable. We have to be able to scale if we do something in a city to the whole city. If we're doing something in one city, it has to scale to other cities. If we're doing something in cities, it has to scale to the whole country, and then from country to country. So everything we do, when you, keep your, when you put it in your basket and think about it, it has to somehow scale. If you're doing a building, it has to scale to other buildings of that type. So always think about scale. So when we look at the building sector, we look at three things. We look at new buildings and existing buildings operations, and we look at embodied carbon. All this construction that's going to go on is a huge amount of embodied carbon. So let's look at building operations first. This is San Francisco. This is electricity and natural gas consumption in San Francisco in the commercial building sector going back to 1990. It's flat. So energy consumption is not going down. And any emission savings is usually due to fuel switching. But energy consumption is flat. If we look at the residential sector in San Francisco, again, flat, except for some warm years. If we look at Los Angeles, flat, not going down. This is energy consumption in the building sector. If we look at California in general, went up. And it's now flat, except for a few super warm years where gas went down. But basically flat. We're not bending the curve down. And it's not only California. It's every progressive state in the US. This is New York State. This is Colorado. Go up, flat, not, go, not coming down. Pennsylvania, Illinois, flat. If we look at the entire United States, we see that energy consumption in the building sector was going up until around 2005 when the 2030 targets were issued, and then it's flattened out, not going down. Thank God we flattened it out, but we've got to, and we're only one country, but we've got to bend the curve down. If we look to the north, Canada, other developed countries, we see again flat. So who do we look to? Do we look to Europe? What about Europe? Europe. The EU 28, flat. So in the developed world, we're still pumping out huge amount of CO2, and we're not reducing our energy consumption. The only emissions reductions we're getting is with fuel switching, but then we lock in another fuel. The problem emissions are going up worldwide is because of the developing countries. China, for example, doubled their energy consumption in their entire building sector in 12 years. And if we look at India, India, their energy consumption is growing at an exponential rate. So how do we get a handle on this? Let's look at the worldwide picture. What do we have to do? This is building codes. In dark blue is mandatory building energy codes. You see that it's all in the global north. That's the good news. The bad news is not all of those mandatory codes are very good. So we're building to, poor, to fairly poor standards. But at least we have something going on in the global north. Look at the global south. Nothing. There's not even any codes in most places. Building energy codes. So it's a free-for-all in the global south. So where's all the building stock? Well, most of the building stock is located right now in the global north. So this is the global building stock. And you see now construction starting to pick up in the global south with no building codes. Now let's look at between now and roughly 2030, 2016 to 2030, the next decade and a half. Where's all the construction going to happen? It all moves south where there are no building codes, no building energy codes. It's an untenable situation. The reason is that the next wave after 2030, if we don't establish something going on there, 
the next wave moves even further south to Africa, India, Latin America, Southeast Asia. A tremendous amount of building goes on in the global south, not too much in the global north. So in the global north, we have to set an example for the global south, and then we've got to work on getting energy codes into the global south. So with new buildings, what do we have to do for operations? We need a zero net carbon building energy code that's scalable internationally now. And then we need to start moving it out worldwide. The good news is China's working on a nearly net zero code. And after being in China for a number of visits, it looks like we've convinced them to actually do a nearly zero code plus renewables to get all the way to zero net carbon. So that standard is now out for review and we're reviewing it and it should be out soon. And then cities and provinces can begin to adopt that standard. So there's a ton of work to be done to get that going. And we'll work through our China Accord signatories, the American Institute of Architects and others that are in China now that can help us move this out. The other good news is that the European Union has the 2020 date. They're going to require all buildings to be nearly zero energy buildings plus renewables to get the zero net carbon by 2020. That's a directive and the countries really need to step up to the plate and develop the standards to do that and implement it. And a few weeks ago, we launched the Zero Code. It's a national and international Zero Code standard that can be adopted worldwide. It's online now at zerocode.org. So the Zero Code is essentially designing an energy efficient building and then adding both on-site and off-site renewables to get the zero net carbon. You need the off-site because you're building in dense urban areas and you can't do it all on-site. So we need to get away from, in a sense, talking about zero net energy, which is the gold standard, everything on site, and begin broadening that definition and moving it out and getting it to scale. So how do you meet the zero code? Well, we use a standard code, ASHRAE 90.1 2016. In 2019, we'll put that code in. As the code gets more efficient, we'll put it in. So efficiency tightens up but it's a national code standard. It has two pathways, prescriptive path and a performance path. The good thing about the national standard is there are literally millions of dollars that go into developing the code, making sure it's cost effective. We don't have to deal with that argument anymore. So the prescriptive path, everything it says you need to do has all been taken care of in terms of cost, it's cost effective, and there's all sorts of software that's been developed that comes with it that, is, that essentially costs millions of dollars. ComCheck, for example, has all the prescriptive requirements. You check off the boxes. It has options if you want to do this or do that or do trade-offs. It'll tell you whether you still meet the code. It'll give you a compliance certificate. It goes to the billing department. They know what to look for. It's all built into the national standards. If we try to do a one-off and a specialty code, then it's a one-off and it doesn't scale. And on the performance path, it's all built into the models already. There are, again, hundreds of thousands of dollars building in the base building and then you design to make sure you get under the base building. And with the zero code, you take either prescriptive requirements, it'll tell you, it'll, there's a calculator that comes with it, it'll tell you what the estimated energy consumption is, the performance path, you plug that in, and it'll give you the on-site and off-site renewables you need. So, it, so the zero code actually provides a predictable and reliable market for renewable energy year after year after year. So we know what we're dealing with. Some big announcements. Today, online, we're now unleashing the zero code for California. So you can go on zerocode.org and it's online. Charles Ely is here who helped develop this, and he's going to give a big talk at, at the Pacific Energy Center in a few weeks, a more detailed talk than we can go into here. Another big development. American Institute of Architects a few days ago announced that they're strongly supporting the zero code, and they can talk about that 
in a little bit. So for existing buildings, we have 223 billion square feet. How do we get a handle on that? Well, there are thousands of pledges, incentives, financing plans, programs, almost all of it voluntary. And efficiency upgrades are running about a half a percent to 1% a year, the building stock upgrading, upgrading it for efficiency. It's not enough, it's not doing it. What's happening is the new buildings are adding to the problem, the efficiency is reducing the problem, but it's evening itself out, that's why everything is flat. We need efficiency to grow, we need to bring the new buildings in so they're not adding to the problem, then we can bend the curve down. That's the key. So we need policies and regulations. We actually need mandates. And we check worldwide for mandates that, have, that affect the whole building sector, in cities, in countries, in states, in provinces. We can count the number of mandates on one hand. That's how much there is worldwide. We need to get the mandates in, and we need to scale it worldwide. Enough with the you know, with all the schemes and everything and everything being voluntary, that's not doing it. So how do we develop policies for the existing building sector? Well, it helps to take a bird's eye view of the city and see what a city is made of. And you can see this is a bird's eye view of Seattle. 2.8% of Seattle's buildings that are over 2.8% of all the buildings in Seattle, over 20,000 square feet, are responsible for 45% of all Seattle's greenhouse gas emissions. So that small cluster of tall buildings in that one area, there's very few buildings, 2.8%, responsible for half of all the emissions. And then you have thousands and thousands of other buildings, tens of thousands and sometimes hundreds of thousands of small buildings are responsible for the other half. If we look at New York City, we see the same thing. Upper Manhattan, Lower Manhattan, downtown Brooklyn, all the big buildings, 2.8%, 2.7% of New York City's buildings are over 50,000 square feet, and they're responsible for 48% of all of New York City's emissions. So very few buildings are responsible for a huge chunk. Then you have a million small buildings that are responsible for the other half. Let's take a look at other cities. That's Los Angeles. You see the same thing. Right here in San Francisco, you see downtown cluster and then miles and miles of small buildings. Boston, Minneapolis, same thing. Phoenix, you're getting the picture. A lot of, a lot of big buildings, half the emissions, tons and tons of small buildings responsible for the other half. Even Vancouver, same thing. Chicago, around the waterfront, all the big buildings, and then miles of small buildings. So that leads us to policy options and how we develop policies. By looking at that, we can now focus down. We know, for example, that if we want to do efficiency improvements, it makes sense to do it when the building is, under, is going under construction, when it's going through a capital improvement cycle. It costs 75% less to do an efficiency upgrade when you're actually doing other construction. So given that, we can develop a big buildings policy for few buildings, mandates, and small buildings policy. So for big buildings, we, we should be requiring an energy upgrade by 2030, a 40, 50% upgrade, and then require zero emissions by 2050. For small buildings, we need to require the upgrades during uh, building intervention points when you're doing a seismic up upgrade, zoning, or, or, uh, or use change, or point of sale. And then you need to provide the incentives. Give me one minute and we're almost done. So now, embodied carbon. Why is embodied carbon so important? Well, if we look at all the buildings that are going to be built between 2020 and 2030, we can see that in year one, almost all of the emissions are from the embodied carbon and a very small percentage, the building's only operating for a year, is, is um, operational. 
And if we run this out over 30 years, we see if we take the area of all the orange bars and all the blue bars, we get something like this. 50% of all of those buildings that are going to be built now between now and 2050 are embodied carbon. The other 50% is operational. We need to get a handle on embodied carbon. We have all the data now from EPDs for 15 years of data. What we need to do now is we need a prescriptive path and a performance path just like the codes. This is what you do and you lower the embodied carbon of concrete. This is what you do for steel. This is what you do for, for glass. And then we need a performance path to do the trade-offs and options. The last thing is that we have two big announcements. One is today we launched the Carbon Smart Materials Palette that sets up, that's the information sheets for concrete, for steel, for wood, for insulation. From that, we'll go into embodied carbon specs. And another group, EC3, is doing the performance path so that the prescriptive path can fit into the performance path and, um, and we move on from there. So the three things, new buildings, zero codes, existing buildings, policies and regulations, embodied carbon specifications and standards, we're here at the Global Climate Action Summit. The key word is action. It's time to act and it's up to us to make this happen. You need to scale it throughout this conference that we need to act now and not wait to make the changes that need to happen. Perfect. That was fantastic.